George Butters, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our first CFG Authors Interview, hosted by Crystal Fletcher. And Crystal is an author, she's a CFG member, and she's the host of All About Canadian Books on YouTube. Uh, you'll find a growing list of interviews there, and I'll, I'll put a link uh, up a little later on. And with Crystal tonight is the one and only Lynn Hancock, who's the author of Tabasco, The Saucy Raccoon. And just so as you know, Lynn is an Australian-Canadian photojournalist, wildlife photographer, and author. She's raised numerous orphan wild animals, including bears, cougars, eagles, puffins, raccoons, and seals. And her experiences while doing all this uh, formed the basis of her 20 books, including There's a Seal in My Sleeping Bag, There's a Raccoon in My Parka, Love Affair with a Cougar, and of course, Tabasco, the Saucy Raccoon. So on behalf of the Canadian Freelance Guild, I want to thank you both for participating. And with that, I'm going to turn the mic over to Crystal, and I'll see you both at the conclusion of your interview or your conversation or whatever this turns out to be. So have fun and talk to you later. Wonderful. Thank you, George, so much for that lovely introduction. I am thrilled to be here this evening, and I am thrilled to be speaking with Lynn Hancock. I had the pleasure of reading Tabasco, the Saucy Raccoon, and it is an absolutely charming book, which made me laugh and it made me cry. So I'm really excited to be able to speak to Lynn about it this evening. But before we talk about Tabasco, I'd really love to divide the interview into three different portions. The first portion, Lynn has lived an incredible life, so I'd love to ask her some questions about her life so we can get to know her a little better. And Lynn, as she's written 20 books, she has is just a wealth of information. And since we are the CFG, there should be some writing questions for Lynn. And then we'll end with talking with Tabasco. And for our audience, please, please, please use the key, the Q&A. Uh, ask any questions you'd like. And in fact, we encourage any questions along the way. So thank you so much. And Lynn, before we start, can you please show us what you are wearing? <laughs> what do you think? I love it. <laughs> I think you see a uh, rackety coon <laughs> or a little bit bigger. Another rackety coon. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> I like to live with my animals, you know. And I'm noticing you have a tail too. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> Oops. Uh, Oops. I got a big bum too, I guess it would show. <laughs> oh. You have to really have to delete that word out, I'm sure. Oh, well, Lynn, as I was saying, I'm so excited to talk to you this evening and to get to know you. So are you ready? Can I kick off with the question? Ask, and I hope you Ask shall receive. With... Yeah. So we're Lynn, can you tell us? I mean, you what was your childhood dream? Um, I wanted to be the best in the class, so I did mostly. I didn't do any playing with friend, with girls or boys. I studied, but I had an interest in horses. My father, for some reason, didn't ask me to learn to drive a car or anything like that. He wanted me to learn to ride a horse. So I thought that when I grew up, I would have a riding school. And I got some group, group together and we planned what we would do every day and what the horses would be named and how many we should have. And I was expecting to be a riding school instructor when I grew up. But the horses became raccoons. Well, they became eagles, of course. And I got engaged on my first date uh, to David Hancock. And I'm Lynn Hancock, so you know where the story can be going. And um, 
And I was, uh, I needed some money before Christmas to go home to Australia after three years studying around, working around the world and traveling around the world. And so uh, I got picked up in the restaurant while I was traveling by this David Hancock, a handsome man who asked me out on a date. And I, my mother brought me up to don't, you know, you don't, you don't do this. So I said, I'm sorry, but I don't, you know. No, but I'm, I'm a good girl, right? I don't go out. But I went. I said, it's probably the last exciting thing I do in my life because the following week I'm catching a boat home to Australia, not a plane, not in one day or night, but in six weeks or something like that from Canada, Vancouver to Western Australia. Um, and so uh, I didn't know where we were going, but um, we were going we went to Barkley Sound on the west coast of Vancouver Island and we were in a little Piper Pacer on floats two-seater, one behind the other. I've never been up in a plane before, any kind of a plane. So as he's flying over these eagle nests and I'm having to find and, and write down, look at the map and, and write down where the eagles were because he was studying eagles at UBC, the university, and in Vancouver. So um, that's my meeting. And a particularly bumpy moment, he said, you are the first girl I've taken up in this plane that didn't get sick. You Aussie girls are tough. Marry me. So I said yes. So I got engaged on my first date. <laughs> so and, here I am now, all these years and, later, still in Canada. With Lynn, them. How, Lynn, how how when how when did you get married after this engagement? Was it a, a few months later? Immediately. Well, immediately. It, immediately, because I was flying home to take, be a university lecturer, and for I had a three year contract, so I cancelled the contract. I got home. I, I first read a telegram. Telegram in those days. Telegram. This is nineteen sixty something. And and I um, uh, sent a telegram home to my mother. Met perfect man. Please prepare a wedding for next Saturday. So there you go. Quick as that. Oh my! My mum and dad prepared the wedding. And so I I used to be a Sunday school teacher, and the church was you know I knew the church etc. And so I got um, quick quick I, I and I and I. <laughs> I, and David, the, the story went in the newspaper, and so um, this rushed romance, and so um, uh, some veterinarian or some sent David a wedding present of a bald eagle, of an not a bald eagle, of an Australian eagle, and my first job as Mrs. Lynn David, David Hancock was to smuggle the raccoon, the the eagle back. To it. <laughs> so I had been I'd married a criminal. I better not say. So I'm, I'm I shouldn't say that, but you know, <laughs> I didn't say that. So, <laughs> so I've had to smuggle quite a few animals <laughs> on planes uh, back and forth, actually. And I've, but I've, but I've confessed everything in books. If you read, if you read the books, you'll find out that that I do that, including Tabasco the saucy raccoon. You know, I smuggled him too. So, yeah, and when you met, oh, I'm sorry. Yes. When you met David, was this when your um, your love of animals began? Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. I, I, oh, I liked horses. I grew up uh, wanting to be uh, to have my own riding school. Um, my my father had me. First thing he did was to have me learn to ride a horse, which is kind of amazing because he weren't in the country or in a city. Learn to ride a horse and not a car. Drive a car. In my case, no, it's always different. In my case, was to ride a horse. So I was going to have a riding school. But when I met David, that that plane, that plan, I was. Uh, he, the first thing he had me do was to climb a tree. Now, I'm no good as a climber, but I managed to get, I had a, something around my waist, and um, I managed to get up a 90-foot tree on the west coast of Vancouver Island and sat for nine hours in an eagle's nest. And I wrote a story, and I think it's in Love of Ever, in uh, Tabasco, the Saucy Raccoon. I, I sat for nine hours in an eagle's nest with two eagles on my knee, waiting for somebody to bring a camera. So it didn't come until midnight, which is a, a bit different, you know, difficult time to take a picture. But I, I, I somehow got a picture of this nine hours in an eagle's nest. So things like that. After I married, uh, after I got this engagement to David Hancock, and then um, cancelled and, and flew back home instead of catching the boat, um, and then we went and got this eagle as a, a wedding present. Um, then um, uh, 
uh, got back home, there was a sea lion that was we were living going to be living in a certain place at Island View Beach in Vancouver Island, and a sea lion from the Pribilof Islands between Alaska and Russia, they uh, said it was on his annual migration down to California, and he. Um, washed ashore and that was my first baby my mum was not expecting a sea lion for her grandchild but she with me that's what she got <laughs> so when when did you know that you wanted to be a writer so how did the writing come into play um because people kept asking me questions and um and I and I started writing a column in uh, in the local newspaper because people were asking for it so i wrote it i called it because i did twice as much as i was asked i called it hancock's half column but really it was hancock's column and a half or double column <laughs> and so i've got them all up in the i've, uh, I've got these um i've got some of them here and these in my office um can't oh I, no, you can't you can't see them, but they're there on, in above me, above me. All these piles of of diaries, like you know, I've got I've got a wall of diaries because I wrote everything down. And oh my goodness! You have to have you have to be here with a camera, so I'll go home and won't waste any more time with it, yours. But still, um, so I've got I've got it all around me. I write everything down on notes, and papers, and diaries and books and and so um how did I get into writing a book I think I was asked uh, by uh, Sir William Collins yes yeah, Sir William Collins he's pretty famous uh, he's dead now I think but he was uh, started Collins Publishing and he asked me to write a book and so I had the publisher come to me I've had the publisher come to me on several occasions. I didn't have to go running after a publisher. You go dressed as a raccoon or a seal or something and you walk in. You know, if I do, they said, yeah, write a book, write. I wrote, I wrote columns in a newspaper first and Hancock's half column because they were actually very long. So I called it Hancock half column. Because uh, I may, had to make it shorter, but there was a there's a radio program or a TV program in Australia called Hancock's Half Hour. And that was, um, I think it's called Hancock's Half Hour. So I called it Hancock's Half Column, but it was really double, double the space, not half the space, because I don't talk short. I don't write short either, as you're finding out now. So, Lynn, the columns that you were writing, they were all about wildlife. Is is that how the publishers became interested in what you were saying about wildlife? Or, But then I I wrote them about whatever I did. Like, for example, I went to the Arctic and I hitchhiked mm -hmm. across uh, the Arctic. And um, and I um, I just, I hitchhike, hitchhike everywhere. I get talking to somebody and say, oh, you know, can I go with you somewhere? Or where are you going? Oh, do you mind if I come? You know, <laughs> I have a pack on my back and I went around the Arctic like that. And I wrote Hancock's half column in the in the newspaper up in the Arctic. So it, and it went right across. across. I, and I, I was in I was in Resolute one day and um, in the airport Resolute and I saw this stranger and I said, oh, where you where do you come from? And he said, uh, Poland. Oh, I said, your poles. Oh, where are you going to? He said, well, we're going to try and get to the North Pole. Do you want to come along? When I immediately think of the headline, with two poles to the pole. And so I said, yes. No, I only did it for a couple of days, but still. <laughs> I, the story is important for me. It is important. And Lynn, you and I had a wonderful conversation about the importance of a first sentence in a novel, because this is something that you believe just sets the tone for just, a novel. Just, can you expand I don't it just comes. Like, for example, one of my books starts with, I was a starry-eyed bride of one week, but I desperately wanted to murder my husband. So you want, they want to know why, right? So that's one of my, one of my beginnings. <laughs> what? what? And, and there's always something, like, for example, in, in this late, my latest book, Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon, um, it starts with, Two tickets to Toronto, please, for me and my pet raccoon. I asked the lady at the Air Canada ticket counter in Vancouver as I placed a wooden box in front of her. She stared warily at the box as if any minute she expected it to explode. I've got the box around somewhere. Oh, here it is. Yes, here's the box. I don't buy. I've got all the things with me. This is the box. <laughs> and I had a raccoon in it. <laughs> so... 
um, that's that's the beginning of that book. <laughs> yeah, and the, does the first sentence come easy for you? Yes, 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 yes. First sentence very easy because that's you don't have to try. You don't have to try. You know, you you've lived the story, and that's the first thing that comes to your mind, and you put it down, and then you go to the back. You know, and go go with the rest of the story, and the endings are like that as well. And um, if you've done the book well and, and you've experienced it and you've experienced the reading and the writing and uh, not arithmetic because I'm no good at arithmetic, but reading and writing, yes. And so it comes easily. I like, so I like my endings. I know I don't like the endings in real life when I was sad and the animal dies, no. But I like the fact that, um, what's the ending? I've, um, I've, I gave you the beginning of the um, yes, that's right. I'll read the ending now of Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon. Oh, okay. Um, and, I, and that ends in my backyard. It's a place Tabasco would have loved. And a curious thing happened as I was writing the last lines of this book. That's a book called Tabasco the Saucy Raccoon. I walked into the kitchen and there... Oh, there, and I walked into the kitchen, and there through the patio door, I saw a huge raccoon staring at me from the edge of the fish pond, the first raccoon that came to my house. It was the first raccoon I'd seen in 10 years of living here, where I'm talking to you, Nanu Spay, British Columbia. Perhaps I was wrong about the otter. Perhaps this was the culprit that ate my pond fish. Or perhaps it was Tabasco in another form thanking me for writing her story. Do you want to raise another raccoon? My neighbor teases me when I rush excitedly to his door to share the news. I'm tempted. Yes, I would love to share my home with another raccoon. But despite my private location, here where I'm talking from, where, the people on the busy roads of the city of Nanaimo are not far away. I am privileged to have shared more than a year of my life with Tabasco, and I'm content to live with my memories, especially now that Tabasco is alive again in these pages in words and pictures, in your heart and in mine. So that's why I'm a writer, because I want the animal or the re reason I'm writing to live on. If I'm crying, I want you to cry. If I'm laughing, and I, I did. Laugh. <laughs> and you did? Good. I did, Lynn, I did. And let's actually, for, for our audience who doesn't know much about Tabasco, can you tell us a little more about the story behind this wonderful saucy raccoon and how Tabasco came into your life? Um, um, I'm trying to think how we can be in my life so, so much. I'm trying to think. It was, a, it was just um, another... Um, I, I got their rep after I met David Hancock. I mean, I think it all started with David Hancock going me up on that first date and, and him telling me to count eagles. And then I wrote the first stories on eagles and et cetera, et cetera. And that, um, uh, then you started going back and writing writing the books, wrote 10 books. And Fletch Basco, the raccoon, is the last one. And I did that after the divorce. But um, I had a reputation for looking after Mother Teresa of the Wild Animal orphan world and and so you know i still people are still giving me animals even now because they're pretty old people now because I, I started my first book in 1960 and that's what many many years ago now but there are some older people around like me i'm i mean i'm i'm 87 i'll tell you it straight in case you don't you're too polite you don't want to ask me how old i am i'll tell you <laughs> Because I don't act like it. I don't think I act like many 87 years old, 87 year old people. Uh, well, I'm here. I am talking. I should. You. I should be answering your questions. Well, no, you're you're doing wonderfully, Lynn, and I am absolutely in awe of your 87 years and your your zest for life is just incredible. But I'd love for if you could tell us more about. I mean, your book is this incredible adventure of you taking care of this raccoon from when it's three weeks old throughout the span of its life. And can you share with our viewers what it was like taking care of this this beautiful little wild creature? Well, I was um, at um, um, university. I decided to go back I, and I'd, I, I didn't go to university to get any degrees. I got three or four degrees or three degrees, but I, I didn't go. I was living in the Arctic and uh, that's another story. Uh, you can read that book in the, about the Arctic. But 
I uh, was uh, getting bashed up by a, a bush pilot and having a very bad time. And so I had to escape or I'd be dead. And so a, girl, a girlfriend said to me, go to university. And I'm about 60, 50 years old, go to university. You're kidding. And so, <laughs> and so she said, no, leave this little town in, the, in northern BC and get away or you'll be killed. So because I'd had a, a bad experience. And so I went to university because she said, Simon Fraser University, look after all people. So I went about 40 or 50 or 60 or something, whatever it was. And so I went and I got an apartment at the bottom of Simon Fraser Hill. And the landlady said, no cats, no dogs. She never asked me no raccoons. <laughs> so I smuggled Tabasco in because I had Tabasco, smuggled him into the apartment up and down with the groceries, you know, the bacon and things on top of the bag and Tabasco's underneath it, you know, going past the landlady. So I did that for a couple of years. <laughs> I lived with Tabasco and I took her to, Indi to, took her to university and she became the mascot of the English department. And um, I wrote about her, I wrote about her a lot. So what did you ask me now? I get carried away. No, it's wonderful. And I was just totally charmed with the way you took this wild animal into your life and how she just captured everyone who she touched. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about, I know Tabasco liked to go to parties. Mm -hmm. um, she loved having a drink, right? Yes. Here. Yes. Well, I let... They're another person to me, you know. So the, yes. I, I, I do everything I do with the person I do with with her, with him, or wherever it is. Mm -hmm. I'd be, I went shopping with cougars. I would be walking down the Vancouver through the Vancouver streets with Tabasco or some other creature running along behind me. Um, I had an um, one. I was a, a, I had an ape, and that the only animal I didn't really want when I heard I was going to have an ape, a gibbon, a gibbon ape. And I, because because the 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 the, um, the vet said you've got to to keep her alive. You've got to you know do all these things you do for a real baby, and and I you've got to you know feed her like just like an ordinary baby. And I because they're very close to humans for the uh, the ape family. Um, but I, I fell in love with Gypsy and took her everywhere where I went and smuggled her on planes too. You know. <laughs> So and I think for those of us now who know how difficult it is to get on a plane in Air Canada with with just your carry on. I mean, it's absolutely incredible reading your book that you that you took a raccoon on a plane in your in your coat pocket. Like it just boggles my mind. I remember going through security in those days. You know, I don't think I think we've got um, more strict regulations now. I don't think so, I'll do much more smuggling. There may not be any more better books <laughs> books for the smuggling. I'll just have them smuggled into my garden here on Oak Bay on Vancouver Island where I live now. And animals come to my door now. What animals come to your door? Um, well, deer, um, mainly deer and birds, eagles. Um, yeah, I have eagles in my backyard. They, 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 um, they're in a tree. They nest. I mean, I think that's, see, I think that's a God of writing or the, I'm, I'm a Christian. So maybe it's just, maybe it's just Christ. I don't know. Just to, But it's, these things happen to me. I don't go and plan it. They just happen. And because you're, you think of writing, you see books in them. You don't just think yeah. them look after them and let them go you write a diary and i've got all that now the wardrobe up there it's full of the diary since 1960 when i left australia to see the world and i've been saving up to go and see the world since my grandmother gave me eight shillings a, a shilling a week when i was eight years old and um i by the time i was um, almost 21 i um took her money that she'd been giving me since she was eight I didn't, and I um, went to England. But once again, I think this is an example. I left Australia in 1960 to go to England. And I went by boat in those days. But when you leave Western Australia and you go west, you hit Africa. But instead of going, 
I know the first day in Africa, we went to Cape Town just for a day, a day, a day to see Cape Town. But I decided I would stay in Cape Town and I would hitchhike to England. So I paid my way, been saving all this money since I was eight. <laughs> I paid it already. I'm on the boat and I get off at the first port of call and hitchhike to the destination. You know, I just decided to do that suddenly. And, and because I, I thought, well, you know, it's boring being on a boat compared to what you can see on land. So I went on land and I've been back to Africa twice since then. And my next book I would like to write uh, on Africa. But actually, uh, the f I've written the first sentence and it's a letter that some, uh, it's a part of a letter I wrote to my parents um, about, because of a letter, because, of, well, here's how, what it says. Um, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, if ever you want to see your daughter again, then get her out of Africa. Because this person had noticed me in Africa on one of my trips hitchhiking around Africa and had wrote to my parents to get me to go home because he said you'll die if you don't go home. You take too many chances. You meet too many strangers. And I met when I met David Hancock, he was a stranger in the restaurant. And that's why I'm in Canada. We're divorced now after 10 years, but um, he's uh, but he was the one that... Um, I wouldn't be talking to you, I'm sure, if I hadn't met David Hancock. Um, and I was just in a, I was in a very, I pretended I would be a waitress for a long time in my life. I'd never been a waitress at all. I just lied. But my grandmother was a caterer. And I used to go along on Saturday nights and pick the, be the best treats off what she was ready, getting ready for a wedding or something. I would go, I would go there with my date for the night and we would go down before the guests came and I would pick a, you know, something off here and something off there. I remember that. <laughs> um, so that's the nearest I was to being a waitress. But I pretended I was a waitress and got this job uh, of, uh, at, at this restaurant that's catered to university students just for a few weeks I wanted it just before I had a bit of money to go home for Christmas where I was going to teach school. I really signed the contract to teach school at um, high school. And um, but I didn't. David Hancock came in, and and, and I had here's another coincidence. I had just uh, been asked. He asked me to go on on a date to Vancouver to on a date, and I said no. I've already got. A, I haven't met the man yet, but my girlfriends have, have uh, planned me to go to somewhere where we're going to go over to Vancouver, the west coast of Vancouver Island. And he said, I've, I'll fly you over to the west coast of Vancouver Island in my plane, little plane, if you go with me. And and he said, and we'll count bald eagles. Well, that sounded a bit more exciting than the first one that I'd already said yes to. So I cancelled the first one and went with David Hancock. And, you know, with the stories going because the Lynn Hancock is telling it. And so at a particularly bumpy moment, he said, you're the first girl I've taken up in this plane that didn't get sick. You Aussie girls are tough. Marry me. So I said, yes. Sent a telegram home to my mother. Met the perfect man. Please prepare a wedding for next Saturday. The church arranged a wedding. I went out, we got married, and I came back. But we, um, I think there was an animal I had to smuggle back. <laughs> he got permission to have all these animals, but they weren't supposed to go in my sleeping bag or my coat pocket or something like that. So, oh, yes, wow. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a crook. I'm a crook. Oh. Well, and Lynn, I mean, wild animals have played such a big role in your in your life and in your writing. Um what would you say that animals, like caring for these orphan animals, has has taught you about yourself? Well, I was too scared to have children because my mum told me it was like an axe going through your body, so I didn't didn't want that happening to me. Whereas if I get an animal that's already born, I can look after it and put it in my bed. <laughs> it's, it's a lot safer. So, and after I had the. the um, I started having these animals and writing columns on them and stories about them. I mean, I once you get and once you get some an animal that that is going to die if you don't look after him and has lost his mother, when well, you get all that sympathy and and all that wanting to help, save the world and its wildlife. And I got interested in the world and its wildlife because I had these orphan animals in my hand or my in my heart, in my pocket, in my coat in my bag <laughs> and so um you know you 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 get, you get to love them and when i come now living here on vancouver island in a i saw i everything a lot of my thing a lot of things that happen in my life that are just just by chance <clears throat> I, I believe god's looking after me and he's throwing me into these positions but they are so coincidental 
that there's got to be some higher power that is arranging all these things. And so <clears throat> eagles nesting in my backyard the first week I cut here. And the eagles are what I got into interested in animals in the first time. I mean, they could have been anywhere in the world or in Vancouver Island, but they nested in my backyard. So that I see that I feel that there's a higher power that is dancing me into these positions and I follow along with it. And I've always come out of it happy you do. a book or something you about do. You I always do. And you the 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 um the positive side because if I can I have I taught school and if I can get I brought all these a lot of these animals to school I was a school teacher and um you know I would have I had a gibbon and a member of the ape family that's I didn't want to look after Gypsy because I had to treat her exactly like a human baby and I thought oh my gosh where's, where's Gypsy's book oh no Gypsy's book um yeah gypsy in the classroom here's a little ape i had you see her book was gypsy in the classroom the only animal i didn't want to when i came back and the zoo brought her to me and said look after her i didn't want to do it because he said he said like she was only two months old but she looked like an old woman her thin little body was frail and heavily lined her tiny face incredibly wrinkled she lay on a hot water bottle in a room heated to a stifling 80 degrees in honor of her tropical origins, um, her origins, a minuscule huddle of long spindly limbs wrapped tightly around her nakedness, a thumb held constantly in her mouth. Shiny black blobs of eyes stared up from a frightened little face. She was an ugly, black, scrawny, bug-eyed spider. I could scarcely conceal my disgust. And the zoo director who traveled to a couple of countries to give it to me, to keep her alive, you'll have to treat her exactly like a human baby. And then he told me I had to do all these things, constant temperature, regular formula, pabulum, Heinz baby food, etc. And I thought, oh, no, I'll bring her to school. So I brought her to school and the ch grade four or grade six in Victoria, and the children looked after her, um, and I got to love her as well. And the ending is I always wait until the animal is dead before I, I tell the whole story. So you have to read the end of the book. So... And and, they, and when they're in a book, they come alive again, you know. Yeah. Their story comes alive. And they and like Tabasco, the saucy raccoon, um, raccoons now come came to this house. And you know, they didn't come to the house next door. They came to my house. So there's, I feel there's something in the spirit world that is coming and putting me in these positions, and I thank God. Yeah. And you do a beautiful job caring from them. And also in your writing, which I really liked, was you you have the balance of this is still a wild creature. And and it's hard because they're cute little babies at first. Like Tabasco was a cute little baby, but Tabasco grew into a raccoon who was maybe big and not as cute. So you talk about navigating letting go I guess in some way shall we say as you watch the baby grow so I can't imagine how hard that would be for you as the caregiver you no know, to lose your baby like with the cougars yeah a cougar a cougar I had four cougars I took them to school and gave I didn't I, I I'm, I'm surprised that I did this but I didn't know anything I was new in the country and I'd had four cougars given to me to look after by a local zoo in, in another country but close by, America. And I um, I brought them to the classroom. And so just like Gypsy was in the classroom for the year, so these four cougars. But I took, I, I kept the blind one, Tom, him, and I gave the other three away to the kids. So I said, well, who would like to take these cougars home and look after them? You know, uh, I wasn't a popular teacher with a staff, I don't think, because I was too different. You know, the, I I think they talked about me in the staff room and said, oh, that Lynn, Han Miss, you know, Mrs. Hancock, da, 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 da. But I didn't care because the children and I were, were very close and, and, and they were, a lot of the kids were poor at school. But, but if you motivate kids enough and give them experiences like this, not only are they helping you look after this animal, but they're writing, they're writing beautiful poetry. So when many of my books have the poems of the kids and some of them had never written poems before. Some of them could hardly write anything before. But if you're motivated enough and you've got a, a raccoon or a cougar or something in front of you on the desk, you're going to write about it. <laughs> you're going to learn about it. You're going to do biology. You're going to be English. And you're going to be good at what you do because you are motivated by it, as I was motivated 
by having cougars fly, given to me in the window. Like, well, I got cougars. I'm lying in bed at midnight and the window's raised above my bed. First sentence, I think. But I remember it. The window's raised above my bed and a man came through the window. It was my husband. He'd lost his do door, key, uh, his front door keys. And this was his way of introducing me to one came out of his pocket, two came out of his pocket, three came out of his pocket, and four came out, cougar kittens. And I spent the night in bed with four cougars and one husband. And I thought, somebody should write a book about that. I didn't know it was me, but I had to go to school the next day, so I brought them all to school. And I said to the kids, I, mean, I didn't know that cougars were I didn't know the reputation of cougars, so I see these four beautiful cougars, and I kept one, the blind one, and, and I said, who'd like to take a cougar home to their parents and, and keep it for as long as you like, uh, for as long as you can? So three kids, well, a lot of kids put their hands up, but I chose three of them, and they took home the cougars, three cougars. Can you imagine a parent coming home and a kid comes home with a cougar in his hand? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I, I can't. I was too innocent. I, I just do what I want. And, and it's good. And the kids got interested in biology, right? If you're going to sit there and just give a, a lesson on biology or something, it's not going to make them interested in the, the, the life that's around them, the wild life that's around them, in biology and want to save the earth. No, you make it dramatic. And I don't make it, I mean, I make it dramatic. You choose what a dramatic, dramatic also, but you communicate it. I want to communicate so kids and others are... Um, uh, whatever they are. <laughs> I know the staff would go by and say, oh, the, the kids never want to go out to lunch. They they want to stay in the classroom with those animals, you know. And this, I know they're talking about me in the staff room. <laughs> this is years ago now, so if they're listening to this program, they're probably all dead. <laughs> now, Lynn, just listening to you, I mean, you are a natural storyteller. How would you, is your writing style, would you say quite similar to how you talk or how would you describe your writing no, style? I, I write like I talk, but a bit more grammatical. Yes, a bit yeah. more grammatical and a bit more grammatical. But I write with enthusiasm and I mean, I, well, I am enthusiastic or I wouldn't have started, started the book. Like um, <clears throat> um, uh, two, the book begins, Raccoon and my, this is um, Tabasco. Two tickets to Toronto, please, for me and my pet raccoon, I said to the lady at the Air Canada ticket counter in Vancouver. I tried to sound nonchalant, as if this was something I asked for every day. She looked up, startled, and then drew back an alarm as I placed a wooden box in front of her. And this is the box that I took on the plane. Um, I know he has to go in the baggage compartment, I said, so I brought my own carrying case. Unless, of course, you want me to use yours? The lady behind the ticket counter stared warily at the box as if any minute she expected it to explode. If she'd been in the bank, she probably would have reached under the counter for the alarm and brought the police. Did you say you want a ticket for a raccoon? She said fearfully, not really believing that I had one. Yes, I said, pull, reaching into the pocket of my parker and pulling out a red woolen toque. I haven't got it here. I didn't know I was going to read this. A red woolen toque. Meet Tabasco. The lump of grizzled fur sleeping sleepily in the wool in the palm of my hand looked more like a pincushion than a one-pound, week-old, orphan raccoon. The airline lady's manner changed immediately. Ah, it's just a baby, she crooned. It's adorable. Then remembering she's at an airport, she says, You can't put that little raccoon in the baggage compartment. It's too tiny. It might die. Well, what do you suggest I do? I asked innocently. The ticket agent's voice dropped in, suddenly, looking quickly behind her to make sure nobody is listening. She is in the Vancouver airport. She says, wrap it up in a blanket and pretend it's your baby. <gasps> now it's my turn to look horrified. I certainly had a baby and I had carrying a bag of baby supplies. I had a bottle, formula, vitamins, towels. Yes, and a blanket too. Somehow I couldn't bring Tabasco through security as a baby human. No, I had another plan. And if you want to know what the plan is, you've got to read the book. <laughs> and so they, the endings I write as well, and um, even when they're sad, mm -hmm. and the ending of this book ends right here, where I'm talking to you from. <clears throat> I wrote the story of Tabasco's life in 1978, just after it came to an end. 
It was not popular in those days to end the story with the death of the hero or the heroine. Publishers, parents, teachers, librarians, book reviewers, and bookstore owners all wanted happy endings. They told, uh, they told me to tell about the good times and leave out the bad. But I can't. You see, I write nonfiction, and I believe I must tell my stories as they happened. I don't make up endings in which a wild animal raised with people goes off into the wild where life appears to be perfect, where she meets a partner of her own kind, raises her kids and lives happily ever after. That, that'll get you more customers maybe, but if you're going to read my books, you're going to read the truth, whether it's good or bad. So in, um, uh, in, in, in uh, Ernest uh, Thompson Seton is another animal writer and he wrote, there's only one way to make an animal's history untragic. And that is to stop before the last chapter. Well, no, I don't. I tell the whole chapter. So I put Tabasco's story, my diaries, my letters, my photos all around me here now, my photos, my tapes and the book manuscript into a big box. For 27 years, I told stories of Tabasco's life to hundreds of classrooms around the world, to thousands of children. But I always stopped before the last chapter until now. And then I could not leave. I had to tell the truth at the end. I live because things happen in my life that are, that are, that they have, don't happen to other people. I live on a secluded beach in Nanus Bay in the city of Nanaimo on Vancouver Island, where people are few and wildlife is abundant. Each day, wild creatures come to my door. Dozens of birds, chickadees, towies, sparrows, finches, juncos, herons, even big flickers, even evil. They fly into forage, or those fly into forage at my feeders. And then I talk about the other animals that, are, that are go, and a river rider comes, and, and, um, and two pages of the animals that come to my back door. Um, it's a place that Tabasco would have loved. Now, I always, if it's a sad ending, I always say the ending. However... I because I, I write the truth. I don't make it up. And a lot of a lot of writers write the truth and then they change the ending to make what the reader would like it to be. Not me. So you've got to get the truth when you read my books. It's a place that Tabasco would have loved. And a curious thing happened as I was writing the last lines of this book. I walked into the kitchen and there through the patio door, I saw a huge raccoon staring at me from the edge of the fish pond. I have never, I've lived here 30 years or something, I have never seen another raccoon, but I did after Tabasco died. It was the first raccoon I had seen in 10 years of living here in Nanus Bay. Perhaps I was wrong about the otters. Perhaps it was, this was the culprit that ate my pond fish. Or perhaps it was Tabasco in another form thanking me for writing her story. That's how the book ends. And she's alive again. She said, um, I would love to share my home with another raccoon, but despite my private location, the people and the busy roads of the city of Nanaimo and Vancouver Island are not far away. I am privileged to have shared more than a year of my life with Tabasco, and I'm content to live with my memories and write in this book, especially now that Tabasco is alive again in these pages and pictures in your heart and in mine. Certainly in mine, Lynn. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, what would you, I mean, you've written this incredible story about your raccoon, a, a very honest story. What would you like readers to take away from this story, your story? I'd like them to be aware of the natural world around them and um, be uh, like I eagles in my backyard and, and therefore I would like, I, I try to to join conservation societies and uh, have people visit and see the eagles in my backyard, for example, or go walking the beach and, and see um, the sea lions that, that, are, that are in certain places because they have to see things. They have to be close to the, before you can be on the side of conservation. You know, you can't just, it's, I, I want to make everything. That's why I, I write the books because I want people to become conservationists, not because somebody says go and join a conservation society or something like that. You've got to have it from your heart if you're to really be much good at, good at it and to enjoy it. 
It's quite, and I, I, to me, it's my life stories. You know, when I look at that box up there, I think of Tabasco. You know, I, I, I think of whatever. There's plenty of raccoons around. We don't maybe have to do that, but, but there's a, a lot of animals that are not. And so once you're interested in the ones that turned you on, you can then get interested in the ones that just uh, want a lot, need a lot of help to conserve their numbers. I couldn't imagine a, a life on Earth without wildlife. I know. I know. And, you know, raccoons, unfortunately, have a really bad rap. Reputation, and I don't. I don't understand that at all. I know. A raccoon. Oh, don't bring them around here. I don't understand that at all. Once I've appreciated, they, they had to do more than just go and eat the dog food or something outside your kitchen door or have to, I don't know what, the, I, don't, I, I don't know what these people complain about when they're complaining about raccoons. I don't know. I have no complaints about raccoons. Everything I do is interesting, even when they're doing something like eating something that's not theirs that they haven't caught. Well, you didn't catch the cow either that you ate from dinner the night before. <laughs> Lynn, Lynn I, I would love to ask you because, I mean, you've written 20 books. You're about to start another one on Africa. Um, how would you say your writing has evolved over, over all of these 20 books? I think I'm very much the same as I did the first one. And the first one was actually... Yeah more the most popular one of any of the books of any of the 20 books so i um what did you say again um well, i was just wondering how your writing has changed over 20 books or or if you're saying it hasn't then that's fascinating too yeah i i, I think that still in my sleeping bag and and tabasco the saucy raccoon they both have the same kind of they're, they're real stories. I write from a diary, you know. I've got these, um, I, like, I'll just take something, like, here. Like, I've got a whole wardrobe of these, uh, of these, of my diaries. This is one year. This is 2004. You see, these are notebooks. So, you see, I, I, I write down every day some words, not in proper sentences, but this, and that's that's just one year it's 2004 but i've got a whole side of my beside you i have you can't see where it, it's and I, I look at i read the diaries so therefore i can make not just by memory of the story i've got what i thought at the time when i'm handling for example a raccoon and then i've got the photographs because i believe uh, i think for having a camera and taking pictures is like a diary and then they're very alive because you're seeing it Wow. Put them back and again. Actually, on that note, Lynn, I think that's really interesting because you, as you said, you use a camera uh, for your wildlife photography and use it part as part of a diary. Like for there's so many of us who would love to be able to take beautiful pictures of wildlife. Do you have any tips and tricks for us? Well, um, you know, some of the pictures of wildlife, if they're wildlife, are not very beautiful. <laughs> I mean, you can. I was chased by a bear, and I managed to get one picture—a picture of me when I ch was ch I chased it. And I'm I'm going like this to the bear, and the, somebody's coming behind me taking a picture of me going like this to the bear, and the bear is running away from me, which is good. <laughs> so I try to get close to the wildlife. Okay, let's let's back back up to this bear. When did this happen that you were chased by a bear? Well, I was up in, in the um, northern Vancouver Island uh, taking pictures of animals and, uh, you know, a bear came by. <laughs> and I, you don't, you shouldn't run away, but, you know, it, that's what you do. <laughs> you don't want to read the books that says, don't, don't run from animals because they'll chase you. <laughs> the thought is get away from here right now. <laughs> Oh, I, was, I, was, I was photographing the bear from a hidden place on on a beach, and then yeah. it looked up and and, um, and it wanted to get closer to me. So yeah. I did run. Like you can't outrun a bear, but I did, and somehow the bear decided he didn't want me. Yeah. <laughs> pretty good. Oh my god! Would you? Is that your most memorable encounter? Would you say with the wild animal? Of a bear. Yes. 
I think I'm a member of a council when I've had them in my hands and you don't really wear a, have a bear in your hand. And actually, I, I looked after orphan bears too, orphan wild bears, and they were the, in a tame situation. And I can't say I really liked them even in a tame situation when there were babies in my house. I, um, I, I, I don't particularly like bears. <laughs> Seals, apes, raccoon. But not bears. But not much bears, no. I was a little bit scared of bears. Oh, well, yeah, I can see why. <laughs> you see why you might. And out of curiosity, how many um, how many orphan animals have you taken care of, would you say? I, I, I haven't added them up, so I don't know. Dozens and dozens. Oh, what, incredible. Yeah. Incredible. I had four cougars. Um, cougars are, I, are one of my favorites. Love Affair with a Cougar. I think if you read the Cougar book, you will get the real me there. Telling, it's very honest, um, mm -hmm. the good, the bad. And um, the Cougars are, have, have I've had more effect on my life than other animals. Maybe, well, maybe Gypsy. Mm -hmm. Raccoons have not had um, as deep a um, meaning in my life as gypsy, as gibbon, a gibbons and cougars. But um, still, I mean, I, I get into Tabasco's life and I live with her. I had her when I went to university. She was the mascot of the English department. Um, yeah, anybody from listening to this program who goes to Simon Fraser University. Should, uh, I used to take her to university every day in my car. <laughs> So, so she's 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 a very well educated raccoon. Very well educated. Well, our graduation, we both graduated together on the same day. I've got a picture of me in my grad hat, not, and the raccoon in her hat, her own hat. Um, yeah, at graduation, I might, and I need help around this office because I, I, I would like to have it all organized to leave it. You know, when I'm dead. And at 87, that's going to be quite close. So. Well, I, th I think you've had such an incredible life and, and are living an incredible life. And I love that you're going to be starting another book soon. You've got your first sentence. How far into it are you? The, um, the cougar? The, the, um... The, um, the Africa one. Oh, the Africa one. Oh, yes, that's right. I've got the, first, the first sentence was part of a letter that was written by somebody who met me in Africa and sent a letter home to my parents. And it starts with, um, Dear Mr. and Mrs. Taylor. That's my name with Lynette Taylor then. Dear Mr. and Mrs. Taylor, if ever you want to see her again, we met you as daughter in Africa. If ever you want to see her again, then get her out of Africa. So whatever they noticed was a bit scary for them and they were trying to help me by getting my parents to take me home from Africa. I've been back a couple yeah. of times after that and um, and you just uh, you have to have excitement or otherwise you don't make it well for your readers and I don't make it up, I'm writing the truth. Where were you in Africa? Right from Cape Town to Cairo. I hitchhiked from Cape Town to oh Cairo. My gosh. The whole The whole country. Well, the whole country, no, up and down. South to north, and then you I married. Such... Then I married an Egyptian, <laughs> and that's going to be a title of another book. I did, and I didn't, and you'll have to read the book to find out why she says I did and I didn't. But it starts. It starts off. I've written the first para, the first paragraph. Dear Mister and Missus Taylor, that was somebody wrote. If ever you want to see your daughter again, then get her out of Africa. And then I go into oh. about this, going through the, the, my experiences in Africa. Oh, how wonderful. And do you work with an editor, Lynn? Do you work or do you just get your whole story I, out first? And then yeah, and I send it to a, a, um, co a publisher. Yeah. Yes. And then they apply a, a, an editor to you to make this much into this much. Because <laughs> I always oh. write that much. Um, well... I'll look forward to reading about your African adventures too, because I'm very curious about this Egyptian that you married. Well, I did and I didn't. <laughs> you did that you did and you didn't, yeah. Yes, I did and I didn't. Well, 
I have questions, Lynn. I have questions. <laughs> and I've been talking so much. Does I should ask, does and do does anyone have any questions for Lynn? I've kind of been dominating here. Let's see. Yeah. Oh, here we go. What would you tell your young self given all of your life experience? That's a great question. What would I tell? Your young self given all self. of your life experience. I wouldn't change what I have done because I have such great endings. Maybe not good while you're having them, but you can always see I, I believe in finding something good and useful out of them and I've always been able to find something even if it makes you laugh make you cry but it affects your your heart your life and if it helps somebody read and try to help the world um, and conserve its world its physical form and its wild life and you get an interest in what you're doing, go and take that walk and look around you, look at the trees, look at the birds, look at the animals, um, then appreciate the whole world. It's not sitting in a house. It's going out there and, and becoming part of it. Learn about it, ask questions, who, where, when, what, why. Maybe writing your own book, even if it's, in, even if it's just in your head. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, when, speaking of that, what, like for, for anyone out there who is an aspiring writer and wants to write a book, what advice would you have for someone who wants to start writing? Write a diary, write a, write a diary. And, and then you've got, you've got all those notes in the diary that are better than blank pages mm -hmm. um, or tell somebody in a letter. But communicate your experiences that you have in life that you would, that you like, that um, or that you hate, but that have effect on you, and and then you've got those notes like, like, the if I had the cupboard around here, just imagine a whole cupboard full of diaries, full of diaries, full of notebooks, full of notebooks, because I I have to have them around to start. I can't start with a blank. Oh, I start with a blank page, of course. But I can't start with a blank mind with taking it all from my memory. No, you when you when you write it and you've written it at a certain point, then you've dramatized it. You, it's real. It's got meaning, and um, and you don't have to worry about remembering it because you've got the notes, and that makes you write lots and get in the habit of writing lots and taking pictures. Here's Tabasco, the saucy raccoon. Um, the kids, I had, I had the, I had the, you know, the raccoon in classrooms, and so um, the children, some children like to tell their stories with right with uh, illustrations rather than. Uh, um, and I recorded Dr. Gozinta because she goes into everything. Raccoons go into everything, and and so this is uh, to, here's to, and that that's, it reminds you of a. Um, um, of a dentist because she's always opening your mouth and looking at your teeth. Yeah, so that's what goes into. Doc, they call her Doctor Goes Into. Um, and this is a uh, Willows Elementary School in Victoria, Vancouver Island. And I like this one. It's a dentist, a dentist in training. Doctor Goes Into, a dentist in trainer. That's my raccoon. And then this is inside, looking out. You see, kids have such a a wonderful if you give them the time and the, they have the talent to use that time and to achieve a lot um so I, I had classes that had bad reputations like for being dancers let's call them that way and they weren't they had when they could when they had animals in the classroom they all wanted to write diaries they had a reason for writing they wrote poems they wrote better than i could write poems and stories they wrote the kids are who eight years old, nine years old, they they did it themselves, and and that brings gives you a sense of pleasure, doesn't it? That you that you've been useful. And, and like here, doctor goes into they're the one they called Tabasco goes into. She goes into your mouth, and she's in the mouth looking out. Um, they, they, these kids are only nine years old. Um, 
Oh. And then they want to write, you ask them to write them not only illustrations, because some people are good at illustrations but not in words, but if they add words to their illustrations, then you're getting them both ways. They're learning to convey, communicate the words and the illustrations. So, so I'm oh. um, either they're some useful, and of course me, you know, it's, I, I um, all these diaries and things, like some um, oh. puppet, you know, that... Yeah, yeah. You see, I've known I've known Lynn for quite a while. You know, she's um she had me in her house, and oh yeah, yeah, she's good time, good time. <laughs> well, oh, Lynn, I think those students were very lucky to have you as a teacher. I mean, you're so inspiring, and we have been so lucky this evening to listen to you talk about Tabasco and your other animals, and we're just so very thankful and grateful for your time like I mean what a, what a ride exactly yeah <laughs> and I will also put links uh to Lynn's website because I mean there are some incredible animal stories but there's also about I, I can't I'm no good at the computer I'm no good at making things up like that. Uh, that that's that's for real people with intelligence that that's not me and so with computer intelligence and um so this was Tabasco is probably the only raccoon in the world with his own website, www.tabascothesaucyraccoon.com. So look that up as well. Absolutely. <laughs> my own website. Yeah. I love you. <laughs> I hope so. I'm putting the words in his mouth. I love you. I love you too, Crystal. <laughs> oh, thank you, Tabasco. <laughs> I love you too. Oh, my gosh. And, I mean, a great big thank you from All About Canadian Books. And um, shall we bring George back on here as well? I'd like to see George in the middle up there. Yes. <laughs> George is the one that arranged all this. So thank you so much, George, and for introducing me to Crystal. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, there you go. Um, that was probably, I don't know that anybody expected what we saw tonight, um, which is exactly what I was hoping for. Uh, look, thank you, Crystal. You were the perfect host for tonight. Lynn, you were the perfect guest to start this off, you and Tabasco. And let me thank you both for taking part in this first joint venture between the Canadian Freelance Guild and Crystal's YouTube channel, All About Canadian Books. Uh, I put links in the resource tab that lit up, so check it out. And well, uh, I hope that they can get it their own copy. I, I think people should know that I am the only one with the copies of the book. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Well, there you go. And so uh -huh. they can find that out on your website. Yeah. I, I, they, people are getting them from Amazon, but Amazon doesn't send me the name and address. So if you send your money to Amazon, they have not given Amazon the name and the name for me, they, Amazon sends me, uh, this is a current problem, Amazon sends me a letter saying we, we have just received the money for a copy of your book. But they don't say give me the name and the address right. of mm -hmm. who to send it to. So I'm unable to send the book out and they have to apply to get their money back. So I want, I want a public place that I can say, I can tell people that. I'm on my website. There's maybe not very many people, but if you're going to do it through Amazon, make sure Amazon sends, you send me your name and address. There you go. Excellent. Mm -hmm. I don't have a name and address. I can't send the book. All right. I'm good. the only one with the books. They can go to the website and send the address to you, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Excellent. Or or well, on or that note, over um, the phone, you know, I'm old fashioned yeah. over okay. the phone or on the computer in an email. I can probably handle those two things better. There you go. All right. Well, we will leave it at that. And I will say thank you very much. This has been different and amazing and fun. <laughs> and as I said, exactly what I was hoping for. Oh, so great. Thank you, both, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you.